cried for your compassion to renew the land again. Thou art standing in your presence, more hungry than before. Now we're on your steps of mercy, and we're knocking at your door. How long? the barren land how long before we see your righteous land how long before your name is lifted high how long before the weeping turns to In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning and welcome to our morning worship for the sixth Sunday after Trinity. Welcome back to the Rectory Garden on what was a gloriously sunny morning a few minutes ago, but the sun's disappeared behind a cloud. Perhaps that's no bad thing because when it comes out I nearly need a sun hat and I'm not quite sure about the liturgical appropriateness of a, of a sun hat uh, with my vestments. But anyway, uh, this is likely to be our last service in this format because change is on the horizon. More about that later in the service, so do stay tuned. In the meantime, we're going to begin with that lovely hymn, Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy.
we worship God before this morning. Let's allow ourselves just a moment of stillness and quietness as we allow ourselves to awaken to his presence in us and around us on this beautiful day. We say together the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our Lord is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we praise God for his grace, for his compassion and forgiveness, in the words of the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer for you alone are the holy one you alone are the lord you alone are the most high jesus christ with the holy spirit in the glory of god the father amen and we pray together the collect for the sixth sunday after trinity Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you, that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
。阿门。So we now turn our thoughts to God's Word. And our first reading this morning is from St Paul's letter to the Romans, verses from chapter 8. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And our Gospel reading is from the Gospel of St Matthew, chapter 13. He put before them another parable. The Kingdom of Heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed, seed, sowed weeds among the wheat, then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected up and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, today's Gospel passage follows straight on from last week's reading from Matthew, with Jesus still in 
horticultural mode. And last week we considered the parable of the sower and the conditions that we need to put our roots down deep and wide into God's love. And today's is the first of a number of sections which begin, the kingdom of heaven is like. And in this case, Jesus declares that the kingdom of heaven can be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But once he'd gone to bed, someone else came along and sowed other seeds in with his wheat. Imagine how frustrating it must be when the seeds germinate and the plants begin to grow to find weeds intermingled with that beautiful wheat. And that word weeds is often translated as tares in some of the older translations. And it's suggested that that word refers to a particular kind of ryegrass. For those of you of a botanical bent, its Latin name is Lolium temulentum. I knew I was going to get that wrong. Lolium temulentum. There you go, there'll be a quiz later. But its common name is Darnell, and the bearded Darnell variety very closely resembles wheat as it's growing. Unlike wheat, however, Darnell has a very bitter flavour and it's actually poisonous, and it's definitely not what you want to be using to bake your crusty cob. But even though the servants spot the infiltrators and offer to pull out the rogue shoots, the master stops them. There's no way to get rid of them without risking damage to the good crop. It's a bit like trying to disentangle couch grass from in amongst the roots and shoots of your favourite plants, a battle most gardeners are familiar with. And I have memories of my mum and I spending hours trying to weed couch grass out of a very overgrown flower bed in our house in Bradford. Those of us who live in the light of Christ's victory over death and evil can find ourselves wondering how it is that evil still seems to prosper in our world. And I think that in this parable, Jesus is giving us a picture of why that might be. In this in-between time, when the kingdom of heaven has broken into our world through Jesus, but has yet to be fully revealed, the wheat and the weeds, the good and the evil, exist together, shoulder to shoulder, their roots intertwined. But Jesus makes it clear in his parable that the time is coming when the status quo will be overturned, when the weeds will be separated out from the wheat and destroyed. And this is the point where we can find ourselves getting a bit uh, hot under the collar and wishing perhaps that Jesus hadn't told this story. Because these days much of the mainstream church tends to shy away from talking too much about judgment. We prefer to be seen as nice and loving and inclusive and all of those are good things to be. And not many of us would be found on a street corner with a sandwich board shouting the end of the world is nigh. But however much we might want to, Jesus doesn't let us duck the question of judgment. Here and elsewhere in the Gospels, such as in the parable of the sheep and the goats, Jesus makes it clear that there will be a sifting out, a separation of those who belong to God and those who don't. His description of what will happen to the latter camp is rather fearsome and perhaps unfortunately uh, reminds me of a story about the late Reverend Dr Ian Paisley who many of you will remember as the leader of the DUP in Northern Ireland and a Protestant minister known for his fiery sermons. And he's said to have been preaching one Sunday about the end times and the day of judgment and to have quoted Jesus' words that there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And at this point, an elderly lady raised her hand and said, but Dr Paisley, I have no teeth. To which he responded, Madam, teeth will be provided. Whether or not that actually happened, I don't know but it makes a good story. I'm never convinced that majoring on judgment is the best way to sell the Christian faith. You're very unlikely ever to hear me preaching a 
hellfire and brimstone kind of sermon. I don't believe that scaring people into the kingdom of heaven is the way forward. I'd much rather talk about the God who loves each and every one of us so much that he would do absolutely anything to bring us into right relationship with him, even if that meant taking our judgment upon himself through his son for all our mistakes and all the evil in the world. That sounds much more like good news to me. Nevertheless, we'd be foolish to ignore the warning in Jesus' words. And we should be careful of assuming too readily that we are on the side of the angels. I think there were plenty of people listening to Jesus in those days who had been long convinced that they were the finest wheat, the champions of the Jewish law, the gatekeepers of the faith. But Jesus was trying to show them that they were exhibiting distinctly weedy tendencies. And we too like to think that we are wheat, but it's worth pausing and checking ourselves every now and again. Are there ways in which we behave more like weeds than wheat? Are we guilty occasionally of stifling the growth of the kingdom because we don't want things to change or we're not prepared to step outside our comfort zones? Do we sometimes behave in ways that tear people down rather than building them up because we're jealous of them or we're intimidated by the certainty of their purpose? We'd be wise to deal with our own weedy tendencies before God gets the weed killer out. I talked a little last week about the danger of pushing parables too far and trying to apply them too literally and we run up against the danger of that here too. Because in Jesus' story there's a duality, good and evil, wheat and weeds. You can only be one thing or the other. A weed can only be a weed. A nettle cannot transform into a rose bush, more the pity, because otherwise I'd have some really lovely rose bushes over there where you can't see the nettles. But people aren't just one thing or the other. They're a whole mixture of things and they can be transformed. Let me tell you a story about somebody that we might consider to be decidedly weedy. And it's a story about a teenager who was very smart, but very rebellious. He didn't listen to his mother and he made fun of her. He moved in with a girl as a teenager and got her pregnant as he sought popularity and recognition. And after living with this girl for 15 years, he dumped her and moved in with another one. He became engaged to this second woman thinking that it would advance his career. And the engagement was a long one, two years. And during the engagement, he hooked up with a third woman. In the midst of all of this coming and going, he left the church that he was brought up in by his mother and joined a cult. Eventually, he became bored with the cult and he became a skeptic. So definitely somebody who was a major weed but is there any hope for someone like that? Well, if I tell you that his name was Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, named after a place in North Africa, which was a Roman colony, and Augustine of Hippo would later come to be known as St. Augustine, one of the most important theologians and church, church leaders of the first 500 years of church history. His mother is St Monica and St Augustine wrote a tell-all biography called Confessions, which is widely seen as the first Western Christian, Christian autobiography ever written and is the most complete record of any single person from the 4th and 5th centuries. So from that very weedy beginning, Augustine became someone who produced a great harvest for the Kingdom of God. And isn't that the good news of the gospel, that however broken and weedy our lives are, if we're willing to let him, God can turn us around 
and transform us into something strong and vigorous that will bear fruit for him. And I think that's the other reason why the master tells the servants not to rip out the weeds as soon as they appear. Because we have to allow people time to grow and to change. We mustn't write them off. Anyone who's been involved in education can tell stories of children who have been written off. Their reputation precedes them from class to class, from teacher to teacher, and no one expects anything other than bad behaviour from them. But sometimes all it takes is for one person to come alongside them, to take the time to listen to them and give them the opportunity to break the cycle and begin again. It's a really difficult thing to do as a teacher, especially when you have 30 odd other children demanding your attention. And the results are far from guaranteed, but when it happens, it's amazing. And God is in the business of that kind of transformation. For most of us, it's not that dramatic, but as we walk in faith, God works in us by his Holy Spirit, transforming our weedy bits, bit by bit, so that day by day we reflect his glory that little bit more. And in his letter to the Romans, St Paul tells us that transformation is not just for us either, it's for the whole of the created order. He has that amazing image of the earth groaning with labour pains, longing for the day when she too will be transformed and restored to her original beauty. Sometimes it can feel that the day will never come when the weeds are rooted out and death and destruction and evil will be banished for good. We can find ourselves saying with the psalmists, how long, O Lord, how long until your kingdom comes and your will is done? How long until injustice and equality cease to blight people's lives? And that's why St Paul says God gives us the Holy Spirit as a down payment, a deposit on what's to come. We can be confident in our expectation that God will not default on his payment. That day will come when everything will be restored, when there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, and death and crying and pain will be no more. In the meantime, our job is to keep our eyes on the horizon, to see the signs of transformation and help where we can, and to do our very best to be the tallest, strongest, most fruitful wheat we can be and steer clear of those weeds. Amen. Sorry, runny nose. In that reading from Romans chapter 8, St Paul talks very much about us being adopted as children of God and how we become heirs of the kingdom with Jesus. And so we're going to sing now a song which is a bit of a golden oldie for me. It's nearly as old as I am, but not quite. Father God, I wonder how I managed to exist without the knowledge of your parenthood. Father God, I wonder how I managed to exist without the knowledge of your parenthood and your loving care but now i am your child i am adopted in your family and i can never be alone because father god you're there beside me i will sing your praises i will sing your praises i will sing your praises I wonder how I managed to exist 
So let's now declare our faith in that God who loved us so much that he's adopted us as his children and the heirs of his kingdom. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So let us turn now to our prayers for the world and for ourselves. And this morning our prayers have been prepared by Margot Hendry at St Paul's. So thank you, Margot, for that. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we ask your prayers today for our families and friends as we struggle to emerge into a world coping with the coronavirus. For those who have lost loved ones and those who are still recovering from this illness. And we remember your family, Lord, worldwide, who have not been as fortunate as us. Those living in war-torn countries, those many millions living in poverty without medicine or equipment to help them. Lord, let them feel your presence as they struggle through each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for our archbishops, bishops and clergy who support us in our daily lives, especially remembering Archbishop Stephen, who has recently begun his ministry with us as Archbishop of York. May he be a leading light in our sometimes dark world as he treads a precarious path. We remember in our prayers also the doctors and nurses looking after us, the tremendous support staff at the hospitals, care homes and surgeries, our police and those working in the food supply chain and transport sector, many of those putting our health and needs before their own. We pray for our neighbours and community workers, bringing us together in difficult times, trying to make sense of a world 
that only you fully understand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the persecuted peoples of our world. We remember all those who are striving for peace. Bless the leaders of nations and peacekeeping forces. Guide the United Nations and the work of relief agencies in this increasingly fragmented world. May we all strive for justice and freedom for all people, irrespective of race or creed. Hear our prayers, Lord, for those known to us who are in ill health, both physically, mentally or spiritually. Those members of our family and friends who have overgone, undergone medical tests this week, we pray for positive outcomes. We remember in our prayers Mark, a father of three young children given only months to live and Amy, a young woman whose cancer has returned. Walk beside them, Lord. Let them know your comforting presence. We pause for a moment to remember those recently departed. Remembering especially the family of Billy Clark, whose funeral took place this week, and the family of Margaret Airy, whose funeral will be on Tuesday coming. We remember too those whose anniversaries fall this week. Lord, comfort all those who grieve for their loved ones. Lord of the morning, let the brightness of your presence scatter the darkness that is around us. Open our eyes to your glory, open our hearts to your love. Fill our minds with your peace, fill our days with your light. Set us on fire with desire for you and your goodness. Let us be the good seeds in your kingdom that hear your words and flourish. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn now, the hymn about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is justice and joy.
close our service this morning, there are a couple of things that I want to share with you. Hopefully some um, reasonably exciting news for those of you who haven't heard it on the grapevine as yet. And that is that in, uh, well, four weeks today on the 16th of August, we will be for the first time meeting together back in our churches which is great and I know how much uh, many of us have been longing for that day to come. St Paul talked about creation waiting in eager expectation and we know a bit now, don't we, about what that longing feels like. So August the 16th, we've had to make quite a lot of changes to the way we're going to do things because of all the, the guidance around um, being safe uh, in terms of the coronavirus. So I'm not going to go through all of that information now. Keep an eye out for updates on Facebook. There'll be updates on the church websites and there'll also be information circulating to you through um, the Wrighton magazine and there'll be a letter coming out to um, everybody on the electoral roll um, in St Paul's Parish. The one thing I will say is that you need to note that we are, for the time being, only doing one service in each church on a Sunday morning so that we don't have to do a massive clean in between two services. And that means that we've had to change the service times slightly. So the Sunday service in St Paul's will be at 8.45. For any of you that normally come to the 8 o'clock, that means you get a bit of a lie-in. For any of you that normally come to the 9.30, I'm sorry, you're going to have to get up a bit earlier. So 8.45. And the service at Holy Cross will be at 10.30 to give me time to get over there. And what we're asking you to do, because we've had to limit the numbers in church so that we can be properly distanced um, and keep everyone safe, is we're asking you to choose, for the time being, either to come to the Sunday service or to the midweek service. It'll be exactly the same service with the same sermon, so if you do try to come to both, you'll just get the same thing twice. But if you could choose one or the other, and we're asking you to let the church wardens know which one you're coming to so that we have an idea of numbers, because what we really don't want to do is end up in a position where we're having to turn people away at the door, because that feels so against everything that we try to do as church. We like to say that all are welcome. But as I say, keep an eye out for much more information coming about how things are going to work once we get back into church in four weeks time. But that's quite a long way away. What's happening in the meantime? I'm going to kind of hand it over to you to do DIY worship. So I'm going to produce, for each of the Sundays, I'm going to produce a worship pack which will have um, an order of service, it will have the readings, and it will have some sort of um, discussion starters to talk about the readings, or it might have some different kinds of activities that you could do that are based around the readings. And what I'd like to really encourage you to do is you could do it on your own, just in your own household. You could, if you're on your own, pick up the phone and share that service with somebody else over the phone. But what you could also do is gather in small groups, preferably in the garden if it's a lovely day like this, groups of sort of half a dozen or so, and share that service, those services together as a kind of preliminary to coming back together in worship as the body of Christ in a more physical way than we've been able to do lately. So you can either do it on your own in your own household, you can phone a friend or you can gather in small groups. And what I'd really like to encourage is those of you who do have access to the online stuff, just have a think about who are the people that you know in church that haven't been able to access the online stuff and be really mindful of trying to include them in your groups or in your phone calls um, over the next few Sundays. And it would be great if you would, if you could, to meet together at 10.30, as we've been doing online, so that in lots of different places in the two parishes, we'll know that worship is happening and that even though you're in lots of different places, we're still all together in spirit 
and in worship. I'm aiming to get those packs ready by Wednesday and have them a number printed out so they'll be hard copies in the two churches when we're open for individual prayer for anybody that doesn't have facilities to print things out. Otherwise they'll be available certainly on the Facebook pages, hopefully on the website as well. So if you can access those and print them out, please do so. Um, otherwise there will be a limited number of packs ready to be picked up on Wednesday. I hope that all makes some kind of sense. If not, um, come back to me and ask lots of questions. Because of that, because of those changes in format for the next few weeks, and then beyond that, going back into church, this morning is going to be our final coffee on Zoom. Um, and it would be really lovely if as many people as possible could join with us over on Zoom for that as a kind of, kind of final hurrah before we can uh, actually be in the same place together. So the details for that are showing on your screen now. They're also in the comments um, underneath the original post for the video. So I look forward to seeing lots of you over on Zoom very shortly. Thank you uh, to Margot for preparing those beautiful prayers for us. And thank you as always to my wonderful husband who does all this technology, who has done it without complaining week after week after week. And what I forgot to say is that once we go back into church, we are going to do everything we can to keep something going online for those who, for whatever reason, aren't able or don't feel comfortable to come back to church just yet. So we're going to try and keep the online provision going. Um, so I'll be very, I'll continue to be very grateful to Richard for his technical expertise and support. I knew there was a reason why I married him. He's making faces at me now. So let's end our worship with the blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and with all those you love, this day and always. Amen. So let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.
Come on.